Offering Podcast. In today's interview, we're talking to Peter Bick. And Peter Bick is a filmmaker who has recently released a film called Root So Deep, You Can See the Devil Down There. Clips of this are currently on his YouTube channel, at Carbon Cowboys. And he is known as the Carbon Cowboy, has been doing short films on regenerative farming for the last 13 years. And um, he also is a professor of practice at the School of Sustainability and College of Global Futures at Arizona State University. So in this uh, interview, we're going to be talking a lot about this new film that he's got and the benefits and sort of the hope of regenerative agriculture. Well, I, I just want to share with you and the audience, you know, I um, was scrolling around on TikTok one day and um, one of a clip from your recent film popped up and I had been already sort of like looking at the world of regenerative farming and exploring this more, talking to people who were into it. Mm -hmm. And I was I was struck the difference that I saw from this short clip. And tell me tell me if I'm wrong here is that it was very it was farmer forward mm -hmm. and yep. i l liked really hearing from the farmers and their transitions and what they were up to yeah um so you know before i kind of go too deep into it um tell us tell us a little bit about yourself and okay. about this upcoming film yeah i mean if you go all the way back i've always been a lover of nature and um we made a film and 2010 finished it called Carbon Nation, which was about solutions to climate change. And by making that film, I discovered soils as a solution if you treat them well and a problem if you treat them poorly. And if you treat them well, they draw down enormous amounts of carbon because they're covered with plants and plants eat carbon and give it to all the microbes. And so right around that time, 2012, I really started focusing on the grazing because it looked like the grazing was the quickest way to turn around agricultural landscapes. And I made a short film called Soil Carbon Cowboys in 2013 with Alan Williams, Neil Dennis, and Gabe Brown. And that really focused my knowledge on what this adaptive grazing could be. And because you just go on their land and you just you feel nature thriving. And when you feel nature thriving and you love nature, it feels awesome. And and so you can hear the bugs, you can smell the plants, the soil is squishy, and it just feels alive, right? The animals are in really good shape, the farmers are happy about it. So I really decided to focus in on that. And But the thing was, there was no science, very little, very little science on this type of grazing. Plenty of science on conventional grazing, plenty of science on the systems that were really fighting nature right? Uh, but very little or no, just about no science on folks who are working with nature, as Gabe Brown always taught me. And so I had just gotten hired by Arizona State University to teach documentary filmmaking. And so I was sort of aware of scientists. I'm from an art school. I went to Cal Arts, you know, so that's not my world up to this point. And I'd met all these scientists that year, 2013, 2012, 2013, and I heard about this grant that was coupling nature and human systems. So I emailed everybody that I'd met and they all emailed back within an hour, two hours max, all saying, count me in, which was wild because I'm not a scientist. I've never been part of a science team. So to get that re response was really encouraging. So we brought everybody who said yes, and everyone did, out to Arizona State in the beginning of 2014 and realized we had a really cool science team with a lot of different expertise, all looking at nature, but looking at it from all their points of view, the bug person, the grazing person, the plant forage person, you know? Mm -hmm. And and so the team formed. And it took us many years to design and fundraise for the research, but we got out in the field in 2018, and I had made 10 short films by that point that started with Soil Carbon Cowboys, and then the whole series then became called Carbon Cowboys. People just started calling it Carbon Cowboys, started calling me Carbon Cowboys. So I just went with what people were saying. Um, and uh, and so we started the documentary in 2018. We started the science in 2018. And now that documentary is done. It's called Roots So Deep, You Can See the Devil Down There. And you saw a clip 
I don't know if you saw a clip from a farmer reacting to our film or if you saw a clip from our film or maybe a clip from one of our prior films, but that TikTok account did not exist in July. Mm. And and our social media team is just knocking it out of the park with what they're doing. Um, I've never known how to do social media well. I, I've 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 social, <laughs> yeah. but I've never known how to use that tool. And they're teaching me on a daily basis how to do it. A guy named James Ashley and 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 um, and Maddie. Maddie Witt. Yeah. Well, I I don't actually recall what the clip was uh, because then I ended up going over to your your channel and watching a few clips and then bouncing over to Instagram and watching a few. And it seemed like your presence over there was a lot greater. And then from there, jumping over to YouTube and then watching more long form clips that looked like they were, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes even um, going more in depth. And then I saw that uh, one of the farmers that you were working with, I don't recall his name, but it's White Oak Pastures. Mm -hmm. Will, and, Will Harris, Will Harris. Yeah. And the yeah. only reason I knew that is because he had been on Rogan like a month or so before, right. which and I thought, wow, this is starting to gain some traction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, Will Harris is, he is traction. <laughs> you know, he's been doing this a long time. We made a film about Will in 2015 called 100,000 Beating Hearts. And what that represents is all the animals he's raising on the same land that his dad raised a thousand head of cattle on. And now he's raising 100,000 animals and they call it stacking enterprises, right? You can raise the cattle, then bring in the sheep and then bring in the chickens and all the other pigs and all the goats lots of different fowl. And so he was a great teacher of mine and as is Gabe Brown. So he and Gabe are like brothers with a different mother. And, and so they're, they're, they're part of my learning as will as, as Alan Williams, of course. And so this has been going on, you know, and you go before these folks, there's, there's French guy named Wasson and there's Alan Saver coming in and there's all these people that have been coming down this road of using nature as a tool to raise food where you couldn't, you had to use nature as a tool to raise food, you know, 200 years ago. Right. But when we get smart and we think of chemicals and we think of fertilizer and we think of mechanical plows and all these things, we get further and further and further away from nature. And there's costs, soil health, that's the cost and, and soil erosion. And so we've lost so much of our topsoil and that's not going to last. We're not going to be able to produce food. Yeah, well, you know. that let's frame frame the problem for us because I think a lot of people they they get organic farming. They're like, okay, no chemicals, no spray, um, and then and then I think a lot of people hear regenerative farming and they think, oh, better somehow. Not sure. Mm -hmm. um, so what 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 is the what is the bigger problem here that you see regenerative farming is trying to. Uh, to tackle what is better about it than just straight organic farming? Yeah, so organic farming, I think it got certified in the early 80s. Um, and it just hasn't grown a lot since then. Like the, the percentage of food being produced organically hasn't exploded. So for whatever reason, the folks who really wanted to do it are doing it, but not a lot of folks are coming in at scale, right? And... There's a lot of, I think there's, you know, the conventional way to grow food is, uh, it's the way it's been described to me, it, it's kind of easier for the farmer. Um, there's, there's methods you can use that are very specific. And, uh, but the trick is the farmers are incurring an enormous amount of debt. So one of the big problems that needs to be solved is getting farmers out of debt. Um, in the US, if you look at rates of suicide per occupation, the farmers are third, according to the CDC. Wow. You've got first responders, oil and gas workers, farmers. And the biggest reason for farmer death is suicide. And the biggest reason for suicide, I'm sorry, I just said this was the suicide rate. The biggest reason for suicide is debt. And so that's a problem, right? And when we talk about organic farming, you could see the most amazing soil on an organic farm covered all the time with a plant so it's not eroding or washing away in the rain. It's always bringing in solar power. It's always bringing in CO2. Amazing, right? The food is nutrient dense. It's exactly what you want. You can also go to an organic farm and because of the rules, 
It could also be soil that's like powder, not covered, plowed all over the place. And, and so organic doesn't necessarily mean healthy soil. It usually does, but it doesn't necessarily mean it. That's not a criteria to get certified. And so when regenerative agriculture has been coming along, it's that healthy soil, the soil health, that's the North Star. And so for me, you give me any system of growing food. If you show me soil health, I'll listen. And that's, that's to me, the, that would be for me what regenerative agriculture is, is that the soil is healthier every year you produce food. Mm -hmm. Because our soils are so degraded, the top soil, the A layer, the, the top dark rich soil that has all the carbon and all the, all the years and decades and centuries and millennia of, 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 of soil being built up, it's being washed away, plowed away, blown away at a huge rate, like massive, massive rate. So when you see a field that doesn't have anything growing on it, or you see just corn stalks, but nothing growing between the corn stalks, and a big rain comes, you can lose tons of topsoil from one rain event. And that's going to wash into our waterways. And if you're putting a lot of chemicals on your farm, those chemicals are washing into the waterways. And so regenerative answers all of these issues. But the, the really cool thing about regenerative agriculture and soil health, if you look at it like a tent, it's got so many doors you can come in. Like for me, I came in the climate change door, right? Uh, a farmer might come in because he's in debt and he's got to figure out a way to grow food without spending all that money on pesticides, herbicides, plows, tractors, right? You could have someone come in because they're really worried about water and flooding and drought mitigation and drought resiliency. You could have someone coming in for food security. Whatever country you're in, if your country's growing enough food to feed everyone in that country, you're much more secure than if you can't grow enough food to feed your country. And so all of those entrances lead to soil health, all of them. And that's to me why, as I've been focused on this for, I guess in my 11th year now, like focused, it's, it's, it's just, it's all good. You know, soil health is all good. I haven't found a problem with soil health. I'll tell you that. And so, so that's, that's that what, re, that's what regenerative agriculture is leading towards soil health. Sorry to interrupt you. Great. Let, let's define that a little bit more clearly. Maybe you can bring in some of the science that you have accumulated over your years of doing this. What are the hallmarks of good soil? Are you looking at microbial content, mineral content, um, water retention capabilities, uh, root depth. What, like, what is it all? You there? got it. All that, all that's there. Um, so a healthy soil is going to have a high carbon count just by default, really, um, because you've got all the plants. Really, the first step is covering the soil with a plant, okay. not letting the soil be exposed to the sun. Um, we did some some work in our film with Alan Williams teaching some farmers. It was astounding. It was a cloudy late spring day in Tennessee, in Alabama, in Mississippi. And you could measure where the soil was covered by plants. It was like 72 degrees, you know, with a little gun that you used to measure for temperature. And if the soil was exposed, it was already 80 degrees. It was it was almost warmer than the air temperature, just exposed with no, uh, obviously you get radiation through the clouds, but no direct sun. The sun came out, he measured it again, the exposed soil was 105 degrees. And the soil that was covered was 77 degrees. So it the soil cover went up, you know, the soil that was covered went up five degrees, the soil that wasn't covered went up 25 or 30 degrees. And at 105 degrees, the microbes in the soil are stop, they stop working. Like they just stop. And a little hotter than that, they die. And so the first thing is covering the soil. And then what happens when you cover the soil, that's a lot of plants. So the next step is you want to have a lot of different plants, a lot of different varieties of plants. Um, there was a paper out of Penn State that said if you had seven plants or more, the the variety, the diversity of microbial of the microbial community goes way up really quickly. Mm -hmm. 
And so if you have 10 plants growing, 15 plants growing, you know, like a prairie would have 150 plants growing, then you've got this really rich, diverse microbial community down there, everyone doing their job, everyone part of a system that's functioning. And some of those microbes will drill into rocks, uh, the, the, uh, the, the mycorrhizal fungi, and get minerals out of rocks. Other, other minerals, uh, other uh, microbes will make sure that the nitrogen that's not available to the plant becomes available to the plant. So the nitrogen from the air then becomes available to the plant, like the legumes and the plants do that. And then the microbes do that. Cycling carbon, um, using it and then burping it out. So carbon sort of cycling in and out of that healthy soil. But there's also different sort of time frames for that carbon. You could have carbon that lasts for decades, like the stuff that's made from the roots it takes decades to decompose. And then the microbes themselves, this isn't across the board, but a lot of them, they're made out of carbon. And when they die, it's called necromass. They actually become part of the soil system. And so the more microbes you have, because of the more plants you have, because of more, more CO2 as the building blocks being drawn down, the more microbes are born. Actually, the population goes way up in a healthy soil system. And we see that in our research. So it's not just diversity, it's, it's population. And then when they die, the theory is, and this is early stuff, but the idea is that you build the soil. Half of that is dead microbes. So you can actually rebuild the soil in a much faster way than than thought possible. You know, through mineralization, it takes a thousand years to build an inch of topsoil. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing farmers do that much more than that in a decade. And so measuring that's really challenging, really hard, because the soil that we're trying to measure, the the sort of uh the heave is covered with plants. And so the technology to measure sort of subsidence when the, when the soil sinks, like if you're draining your aquifer and the surface of your soil actually sinks, you can measure that to a centimeter of accuracy from a satellite. We're trying to use that same technology to measure the buildup, which they would call heave, but they can't get to the soil surface because it's covered with plants because that's what a healthy soil system has. So we haven't figured that one out yet. Mm -hmm. um, to measure that quickly. Um, so that's that's healthy soil. And then what happens is when you have all those different types of plants, you have a huge variety of insects. And in our research, we saw on the adaptive side, 33% more variety, diversity of insects. And what's really cool about the insect community is if you have just one plant growing, one insect that loves to eat that plant could proliferate and be an incredibly dangerous pest because it'll eat that whole field or try to. But if you have a lot of plants growing, that one pest bug that was wanting that one plant, well, it's just part of a community now. And eating that plant's actually a good thing in a diverse forage world. And so it becomes a, 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 a tax paying member of society, right? It becomes a, a, a community member. And so that, that diversity of insects also equals a very functional system. And so that's what we see on the regenerative side. And then when you have all those insects, who's eating the insects? Birds. And so you get a lot more variety of birds, species and abundance. And the grassland birds specifically, in the US, we've lost over half since 1970, 51% loss across the board. Some of the species have been lost up to 85%. But on the adaptive side of our research, we see three times more grassland birds than on the conventional side. And that is a huge motivator for a lot of people. People love birds. They love birds. And so, and then, so that's all driving healthy, healthy soils driving all of that. And then obviously the animals that are eating all that good forage, if you do eat the animals, those animals are now healthier. That's not in our research, but that's in other research that's coming out right now, like Fred Provenza, Stefan van Fleet. Those scientists are doing that research. And that's pretty remarkable. It makes sense, right? I was just talking to a, a fellow yesterday who was raised uh, in the Navajo Nation, and his grandfather told him that the sheep they were eating was medicine because they knew the sheep they were eating had a great variety of forage to choose from. So it's all connected, man. Yeah, it's all connected. I, I, well, you know, I got to regenerative farming into your work uh, from a health background. And yeah. 
Um, so doing health coaching for people and a lot of that, uh, a lot of the issues that people are having in a calorie dense world are nutrient deficiencies. And so it's like people are malnutritioned in calorie density, in high density calorie situations, which is basically like the first world. And, and so you go, well, why aren't the minerals in there? And, and so you just keep going back down the web until you get to the soil and, 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 and what's so cool about it, like you said, there are many doors, it serves many communities to be regenerative farming. Yeah. It serves everyone. Everyone is served by this. I agree. And, um, and so in listening to you talk about it and watching some of your clips, these are multi-dimensional farms. I mean, you are, you have multiple crops. I would, I'm assuming multiple cover crops, multiple cash crops. You've got, um, multiple livestock grazing. It's a, they keep getting layered and it's almost like the, the, the complexity of it, um, makes the symphony more rich and, mm -hmm. um, and, and you just, as long as you can get that balance right, that it becomes really thriving. So my question, and I think a lot of people's question is, um, how big can it scale? Mm -hmm. Um, can, is, what is the largest regenerative farm that you're aware of? Um, and, and like, give us an idea of how many people that's feeding and, and how big do you think that this can get? Well, there's a lot of people on our team that, that think that if we don't go down this road, we can't feed the world. Like the risk is not changing. The risk is not changing. The risk is not changing because of human health, because of soil health, because of climate change, because of water cycling, because of farmer well-being. If our farmers aren't well, they're going to be cutting corners to grow our food and then we're not well. And so it's, it's, it is all connected. Um, in my short films, I have more of those stacked enterprises you just described. In our research that's in our new documentary, Roots So Deep, those are pretty much focused on cattle grazing. One, one, two of the farms also had sheep on their farms, but our research was on, on the cattle, just to be clear about that. Okay. The biggest cattle ranch operation that I filmed, it's a short film called Herd Impact. It's one of our short films that we made. And that's uh, 14,000 acres, and it's 5,000 head of steer. And it's a husband and wife in their 60s and one other person sometimes who are moving those animals multiple times a day during the growing season because all they have to do is open up the fence, the, the hot wire fence, and the animals come in because they know it's better food. It's amazing to see how easy it is to train these animals to then do exactly what you want. And then what happens when the farmer's right there watching the animals walk in, the stragglers, they're the ones who need help. So then they can see what the health situation is. They're there sometimes four times a day, three times a day, twice a day. So they really get to see their animals so that the medical costs go way down. They're not giving every animal antibiotics and other medicines, like sort of, they call it prophylactically across the board. They're only giving medicine to the animals that need it and they can see when they need it. So it's a huge cost savings there and time savings. Um, so that that 5,000 head is the biggest operation I've seen. And I believe that the average herd side in the U.S. is between 30 and 70 head of cattle, the average herd side size. Um, in our study, we've got herd sizes around 150, 200, about on, you know, smaller than that, but around there. Um, so it's, you know, most farms are small. What happens in the cattle business is when all those farms ship their animals to the feedlots and then it becomes so centralized. And then you get all sorts of problems. You get the manure problem because they're not out on the field. You get the issue with having to grow so much corn and soy to feed those animals. And the way that corn and soy is grown could be regenerative, but at scale right now, it's not. And if you look at the carbon implications of the way the corn and soy are grown, it's much more warming of the planet when thinking about climate change than any of the animal operations in the US, especially cattle. So that that grain production is a big issue, a big issue. And so scale wise, you know, it's like Will Harris says, you know, he wants to feed his community. He doesn't have to feed the world. We in the United States do not have to feed the world. The world 
wants to feed the world. And can we feed the world while regenerating our soils? Can we actually produce enough nutrient-dense food doing that? I believe the answer is a strong yes. Everything I've seen shows that. And I don't know. I, who would say that that's not possible? You have to ask them. Are they leading us to soil health? That's what I would ask everybody. What are some of the challenges that farmers face when they, if they want to convert from this sort of conventional way to mm -hmm. this, this new way? Yeah. So knowledge, right? A lot of farmers have never been taught about soil or soil health specifically. It's a new thing. And it's, it's, it's absolutely not the fault of the farmer that that's the case. It's, it's just the way it is. The way the education system, the way we've educated farmers for a century is not really focused on the soil. It's focused on yield. And the way you get bigger yields are with machinery and chemicals and all those things. That raises the yield, but it hurts the soil. It doesn't raise nutrient-dense food, and it doesn't necessarily make the farmer more money. So when farmers are thinking about profit per acre, not yield per acre, they can get themselves back to a soil health focus, which I, again, would say that we're going to feed ourselves much better when we focus on soil health. So some of the costs, let's look at grazing specifically. Let's say a farmer's been growing row crops and they want to get into grazing. One of the costs would be they're going to have to put that exterior fence in, right? And they're going to have to get water. So you might have to put some pipes in or hoses and get water available around your land because you're going to be feeding animals in smaller paddocks. So they're going to need to have a water source. Uh, do you want to plant more trees? So your animals have more shade, more windbreak, more places to go when it's, when it's raining. Um, do you have the right animals for amp grazing? Or, you know, like the South Pole is a breed that's like ideal for this type of grazing. And so do you need to get different animals? Um, and then teaching, right? Folks to come in and, and be there and come in every couple of months and see how it's going and, and help you. Like the teaching piece is really important. So all those could be costs. Um, and then the, the issue of if you've been using a lot of fertilizer on your fields and you're switching to not using fertilizer on your fields, will you have a dip in production before eventually you start producing more? Like let's say, you know, you've got this kind of production level and you have a dip and that some folks say it takes three years to get above that. I've heard that. And I believe that's happened for folks. I've also seen where people just turned it around so quickly, you know, because a lot of grazers have to bush hog their fields because their animals aren't eating everything quick enough. And so if you can manage your fields so that you know, it's like uh, stockpiling, you're able to manage what fields are being eaten. So then, you know, in November and December and January, you still got forage out there. So you don't have to feed that much hay then it becomes much more efficient and much less expensive. Hay is like a huge cost for farmers. So you'll have those costs, but the savings will be your operating expenses will go down quite a bit. Fertilizer bills go down or disappear. Uh, heavy equipment disappears or you use much less or you can borrow neighbors and you have sort of a co-op situation. Um, medicine bills go way down like we spoke about. Pesticides, herbicides go way down or go away. Um, and so just those costs going down become a huge savings. Fertilizer alone is such a huge cost right now. Um, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars a year for farmers to, to pay for fertilizer, if not more. And so in our study, we showed that there was more nitrogen, more usable nitrogen, just under 10% more on the adaptive side in the soil than on the conventional side, and the adaptive side doesn't pay for fertilizer, doesn't have that expense. And many of the conventional farmers do have that expense, if they can afford it. So imagine you're paying for something that you have less of than if you're just using nature and you have more of it. That's a yeah. huge delta right there. That, that covers all sorts of costs right there. One of the... Uh 
seemed like the features that was standing out to me looking at some of these clips was um, sort of the speed at which um, these farmers are rotating the cattle. Um, can you talk about that versus how it usually is done? The way conventional grazing has been described to me and the way I've seen it is a farm might have, you know, two or three, 400 grazable acres, and they might break that up into four paddocks or three paddocks or six paddocks. And they'll let the animals into those paddocks, which are fairly large for two weeks, two and a half weeks, three weeks. And the animals self-select. And so they overgraze the things they love and they don't graze at all the things they don't like. So the field itself gets out of whack. And the perception of a nice clean field, like you couldn't hide a golf ball in it, that's that is what is sort of taught as what it should look like. On the adaptive side, across the fence, they're growing their forage in the growing season up to their waist, which is like ugly as sin to a lot of farmers who've been taught, let's make it look like a golf course. Let's make it look like a park. So that's a big shift right there. Um, the animals are moved not every two weeks or three weeks or however long it is, but they're moved in the growing season in the Southeast US, you can move your animals three or four times a day. And so the idea is to eat half the forage, the animals stomp the rest, their manure and urine is fertilizing in a nice even way because they're, they're sort of packed into a, a smaller area. And then they're moved on to the next, to the next field. And uh, so that's sort of an emulation of the way the bison moved across the Great Plains in a microcosm, right? You're not having a herd of bison that took five days to walk past you, right? You've got a 150 cows and their babies in an acre or two or three or four acres. They're eating there for a couple hours or a day. And then you open up that real easy to put up poly wire fence and they all walk over there. And a lot of times the farmer will leave the fence open. They could walk back, but they don't want to. They could spread out, but they actually don't want to. They want to be eating that fresh food and then and then moving on. And so that's that's kind of the difference right there. It's a time thing. And Small a rest. Paddocks and faster uh, and faster movement through the paddocks. And higher density of the animals themselves. And then the most important piece of this, after they've eaten half stomp the rest down to cover the soil to keep it all cool, moist, not have evaporation, not have the microbes die from heat, is the rest period. And depending on where you are in the world, that rest period might be 30 days, 90 days, a year, two years, whatever it is, all based on really based on rainfall. So the more rainfall, the quicker you move them, the less rainfall, the longer the rest periods are. But that rest period is where the plants regrow suck down all that CO2, right? And and in our study, we're seeing that they're sucking down more CO2. The cooling of the CO2 is stronger than the warming of the methane and the nitrous oxide from the animals in the, in the farm system itself. So net, we're seeing that the adaptive side is bringing down enormous amounts of carbon to counterbalance the warming of the methane and the nitrous oxide, which is real. No one in our study is saying that that's not real. It's just the carbon is counterbalancing it at a high rate. That's that's awesome. Wow. Um, so what is the status of the film now? Is it, is it uh, are people able to see this? Is it not yet been released? Yeah, so we're on what we call our hometown road show. We're showing it to farm communities where we made the movie, where we filmed. And then it's just sort of grown. So we're showing it to all sorts of communities around the U.S., I think it just played in Norway. Canada's coming up. Um, and so we, we're about at 40 screenings. We've done universities, churches, barns. We've been in the UK for two screenings, three screenings. And um, so we're, it's a four part, ep it's a four part docuseries, each episode about an hour. And so when we go live, we're showing episodes one and four. It gives you the arc, but it doesn't give you everything. Um, but it keeps people for two hours instead of four hours. And and so if you go to our website, rootsodeep.org, you'll see a button. It'll say a range of screening. So we have people calling us daily, working on arranging screenings right now. And then it's not 
solid yet, but what we're looking to do is to make the whole series available, at least in the US, probably in the UK, Canada, English speaking worlds, because we haven't done the translations yet, um, English speaking countries, is to have it rentable online. And that'll be at our website as well. So the best thing in the world for us is if people go to our website, rootsodeep.org, and sign up for our newsletter. Uh, I've just been learning, you can't send a newsletter to someone whose email you have. You have to ask them if it's okay if you send them the newsletter. So I'm, like I say, I'm learning a lot about uh, about, <laughs> about the social media world. Um, but if we get people to sign up for a newsletter, we don't write a lot of them. So it's not like your inbox is going to be packed. We'd, I'd need to write more, quite frankly. Um, but that's how we'll let people know when it's available. Yeah. What's uh what's next? Uh promoting this movie, um this this series, uh getting all the science finished. Um the uh the greenhouse gas data I just told you about is still in process. So we've got to get that to publication. A lot of our papers have been published already, and that's also on our website. You can see it under published research. Um and we have just as many papers still in the pipeline at various different stages. Getting farmers the information, so if they want to change, make it easy for the farmers to change. I'm working on a pilot program that has that built in. Getting the film out to farmers, letting them know this is possible, and then connecting them with the teachers, connecting them with the finance, if they do need finance for the fencing and the water points, possibly new new breed of animal you know, at a low interest rate that's, you know, impact investing money and just get this ball rolling and then continue the science, continue the science. We can measure what's happening on these systems so that if a carbon market or a greenhouse gas market, you know, the farmers can make money there. Let's make sure it's honest and real, not, not shenanigans. Ecosystem services, can we measure the birds at a consistent rate? Would someone pay for more birds, you know? Uh, water cycling, you know, if a farm area above a city has a lot of healthy soil, when it rains, that farm area isn't going to be f sending as much water downstream because it's going to be soaking up so much more water. And so the city downstream might have less flooding as a result. What's that worth to the city? Um, if a whole, like a whole watershed is farming regeneratively, the water going down to that city's water treatment plant is going to be a lot cleaner. So it's going to take less energy to clean the water for that city. What's that worth for the city? So how do you monetize that and support the farmers for doing stuff that they'll be doing better anyway? The farmer doesn't need a carbon price, doesn't need ecosystem services because their operating expenses are going to go so much lower. That's their initial profit delta right there. Yeah, so that's um, what's next. <laughs> traveling. Yeah, uh, just a little bit of stuff, right? Just, yeah. Just a few things. Traveling, traveling, traveling. And then, um, you know, I teach. So every Friday during the semesters, I'm teaching students how to make short documentaries. So all my travel gets me back Thursday night, if at all possible. I've done a couple of remote classes over over the years, for sure. Um, yeah, I think the last question I have is about regenerative farming in the desert southwest. Um, you, you and I both reside here seems like it would be the most challenging uh, yep. region of the continental U.S. to do it. Uh, what what do you know about farms that are in this area? Um, and tell us about that. It's funny. I, I live here, but all my research and stuff is in the sort of the part of the country where I'm from. I'm from Kentucky, and so the southeast U.S. Um, the person who I would go to for knowledge about grazing in the desert is a guy named Alejandro Carrillo. And he has a ranch in the Chihuahuan, um, in the Chihuahuan, yeah, in the Chihuahuan Desert, sort of fly into El Paso and then fly down, and you're in that part of Mexico. Um, you know, in in his neck of the woods, folks need a hundred acres per cow per year to have enough forage. And with him doing adaptive grazing, he's got it down to 20, 22 acres per per cow. So he's knocked it down to a fifth of what's the county average or the province average, state average. And so he's going down the right road. And, and you see pictures of his work. He's on Facebook. It's it's awesome stuff. 
he's got this amazing picture where there's a fence, his land's on the left, neighbor's ranch is on the right, and the rain is falling on his land and not on his neighbor's because rain follows plants and he has a lot more plants. That's the theory, right? So more science, let's figure that out more, but that's what it's looking like. And so, um, and then the thing that, that a lot of people don't consider when they're thinking about moisture is dew. And I asked him, I said, are you hearing the dripping of dew in the morning when before you didn't in the desert? He's like, absolutely, absolutely. We just did an interview with Alejandro. I think we posted it on last Sunday. So it's, it's in our social. Oh, I should mention that too. Our social media is at Carbon Cowboys on all the channels. That's our, that's our moniker named after the short films um, that, that got us going in this world. Um, so, so it is doable in the desert. It's going to take longer. You're going to need good teaching, right? Um, but it's absolutely doable. You can see it. Awesome. Peter, thank you so much. Keep up the great work. I appreciate it. Jonathan, thank you for inviting me on your show and, and uh, allowing me to yak over long periods of time about this work. It's, it, it gives me purpose and it gives me hope and it 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 really regenerative agriculture soil health it answers so many problems it solves so many problems the question is can we get enough farmers to actually have it make an impact on watersheds states countries and the planet and that's a big if getting people to change is difficult um but what i say to folks i meet is it might feel risky to change, but right now with what we know about climate change and economics and all the other factors, it's riskier not to change. And that's that to me is a pretty compelling reason to at least listen. Listen. Yeah, well, I think you nailed it. It's There's something very, you can't um, help but feel hopeful when you learn about regenerative farming and you start to engage with it. And that seems that seems like the farmers that you were interviewing too, also feel that way. I mean, I definitely feel that. So uh, yeah. it's pretty exciting. It is. It is. People trust nature. Mm -hmm. And nature's trustworthy. And nature wants to be healthy. You know? And so all those things going for us. We just, as Gabe says, just work with nature. Stop fighting her. <laughs>